Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we are doing an installment of Creationists Behaving Badly and we are talking about Dr. Rob Carter from Creation Ministries International. So Dr. Rob Carter is uh, affiliated with Creation Ministries International, CMI. You can find them at creation.com. He also runs the Biblical Genetics YouTube channel, which is linked down below. In fact, I'll just say this right off the top. There are going to be a ton of references for this video. Other videos, articles, just a lot of different things I'm going to talk about here. The references for all this stuff, it's going to be down below, basically in the order it appears in this video. So if there's anything you want more details on, just go down below. You'll be able to find the link and find whatever details you need. So uh, what we're talking about today is that uh, Dr. Carter recently responded to a recent Guts at Gibbon video, it's uh, Erica, friend of the channel, Guts at Gibbon, on uh, human-chimp genetic similarity. She did this big, long analysis of uh, Dr. Tompkins' work. Uh, uh, he's affiliated with ICR, the Institute for Creation Research. So Erica did this big, long analysis of Jeffrey Tompkins' work. And Dr. Carter uh, decided to respond to Erica's work. Basically, everyone's going to defend Tompkins except Tompkins himself. Um, and there were a lot of problems with Carter's response to Erica that made me have some realizations about Dr. Carter and how he participates in this discourse. Uh, but to understand what's going on here, we need to go back a little bit because there's a whole big backstory and history here, and we kind of have to build up the foundation of how my thinking on this got to where it is. So that's what we're going to do. The first thing I want to convey to everybody is that Dr. Rob Carter is an expert in the stuff he's talking about. He has a legitimate PhD from 2003 from the University of Miami, which just an aside is probably a great place to earn a, a PhD in marine biology, right? Nice warm oceans down there. It's got to be cool. Uh, he's got a whole bunch of legitimate scientific publications. You can find this list that's pictured on screen on his bio page on creation.com, the CMI website. I think the heading for this is secular publications. He also has a bunch of uh, like creationist publications, but they're not here. He's separated this out. These are his legit peer-reviewed publications. Now, I want to be very clear here. He bills himself and is promoted as a geneticist, right? An expert in genetics when it comes to evolution and creationism. A lot of the work here, and you can see the titles here, a lot of the work that he's done here that's published is like molecular genetic stuff rather than like population or evolutionary genetics. And I want to be crystal clear about this. That's okay. I mean, I'm an evolutionary biologist. My degree says right on it, molecular genetics. But, like, I did a whole lot of population genetics over the course of my graduate work, right? So it's totally cool that he's done work in primarily molecular genetics, and then he's talking about more population genetic stuff in his capacity as a professional young earth creationist. That's okay. He is a professional credentialed creationist who's an expert in genetics, which is more than you can say for most young earth creationists who just like to, you know, spout off on the internet, right? That's fine. That's kind of our starting point here. He is a legitimate expert, and I want to be clear about that because I want everybody watching to keep this phrase in mind as you watch kind of the next segment of this video. And the phrase is this, Carter knows better. As we're going to see, he's going to make a bunch of arguments that are really, really, really bad. And what I want everyone to keep in mind as we talk about the arguments that he has made is that he's an expert in this. He knows better. So let's get into some of these arguments. We're not going to go through everything in detail. That would take way too long, but we are going to touch on the most egregious examples. So again, remember, Carter knows better as we go through this stuff. The first thing we're going to talk about is an article uh, he put out a few years back. This was from December of 2020 called African Origins and the Rise of Carnivory. This was like uh, answering uh, emails that came into uh, CMI. The carnivory stuff you can just ignore. He answered two separate questions in here. We care about the African origin stuff. So this is like the out of Africa model for human origins and migration and how to explain human genetics in the context of like an out of Africa babble dispersal kind of model. That's what this is about. 
So I actually covered this. Uh, again, links down below to all of this, the article, my response. I covered this uh, way back with uh, Just a Walking Fish, friend of the channel. So you can check out that video if you want all the details. But the thing I want to point out here is that he makes a couple of, like, just clear errors and omissions in his arguments. Things that he should talk about and he doesn't, or things that are directly contradictory with each other. So, for example, he ignores the fact that all non-African human genome sequences nest within the African clade, right? There's a sub-Saharan African most recent common ancestor for all of humanity. And within that clade, descended from that ancestor, you have all of the non-African sequences nested within that, right? You need to explain that, and he just doesn't. Uh, he also ignores the gradient that we see around the world of this thing called linkage equilibrium. Now, what that is is beyond the scope of this video. You can, again, see the longer video for a discussion about it. But basically, it's if you look at a population... How well mixed are different parts of the genome with each other? And basically, as you get further from East Central Africa, human genomes become less and less well mixed, right? Different parts become more tightly associated with each other. And Dr. Carter proposes a bunch of solutions to this problem of this pattern of human genetics of having more diversity in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, but his problems actually make, th his solutions, I should say, actually make this other problem worse. Because if you have, as he proposes, isolated lineages with high mutation rates, then you're going to have very high linkage disequilibrium among those different subgroups, right? Because they're isolated from each other and they're experiencing different mutations. He just completely ignores that contradiction in his argument but he totally knows the ins and outs of the structure of human genetics, right? He totally understands how that works, and he's just ignoring it. So for more of those details, check out the video down below. We can also talk about a clip of his that needs a little bit of background here. So what's going on here is you may have heard of the documentary from a few years back, Is Genesis History? There's going to be an Is Genesis History Volume 2, as of this recording, it's not out yet, but what seems to be the case is Dr. Carter recorded uh, one or more clips for it. And one of those clips, it's about a 10-minute clip. You can picture it here. Again, link below. You can, uh, uh, the Is Genesis History YouTube channel put up this clip. It's about 10 minutes long, and in that clip, Dr. Carter manages to get basically everything about human genetics and evolution wrong. Just like clear, unambiguous errors that I know he understands the ins and outs of because I have had exchanges with him about these topics. So like, to use one example that's particularly obvious, he conflates the mutation and the substitution rates. He says that you can take the per-generation mutation rate as measured by parent-offspring pedigrees and extrapolate that backwards in time infinitely with no changes. It's a linear mutation accumulation. But he also knows that there are complications that make that not work. He has said correct things that invalidate that extrapolation on video. Like, he knows how natural selection works, and that it reduces the substitution rate relative to the mutation rate. He acknowledges these things, um, but he still makes the argument, right? He knows better. Uh, and I actually covered this along with uh, Erica, and... Dapper Dinosaur, friend of the channel, we did a long video covering this clip, uh, really going into detail. Again, link below if you want all the details on all of the extremely terrible things Carter says in a 10-minute span. It's actually really impressive. Continuing on, uh, we have the Dismantled documentary, and this example might be the most single, just, like, obvious, egregious example of Carter saying something that, like, he clearly knows is nonsense but he says it anyway. And what he does here in this part of the Dismantled documentary is he conflates the census population of cheetahs with the effective population of Homo sapiens. Now, this is a little bit technical, so let's take a minute here. Uh, the census population is just how many individuals there are in a population. The effective population refers to the number of reproducing individuals. It's, um, you can look at it as a measure of, of genetic diversity within a population is one way to conceptualize your effective population size. And what Carter says in this clip from this dismantled documentary 
is that, well, cheetahs, they're going extinct because of things like inbreeding. Uh, and they went through a bottleneck where they had a population, a census population of only about 10,000. Humans had, uh, at their minimum, a population of an effective population of about 10,000. Therefore, we're going to go extinct too. It's not genetically viable. That's not a valid comparison. That's an apples to oranges comparison. And Dr. Rob Carter knows that. In fact, uh, when we did our, our comprehensive, no pun intended, dismantling of this documentary, myself, Erica, and Dapper Dinosaur, I feel like there's a pattern here. When the three of us did our big five-part series on this, uh, Dapper Dinosaur called him on this specific thing, and he actually corrected it. He actually put out a video saying, hey, yeah, you're right, you can't conflate those two things. But here's the thing, he knew that beforehand. He clearly knew going into it that a census population and an effective population are genetically two different things and are not comparable. He's an expert. He knew that. He knows better. He was just pulling a sleight of hand and he didn't get away with it. So he had to correct it. And then we get to the paper that I call my favorite bad paper of all time, the 2012 H1N1 genetic entropy paper. This was a new look at an old virus, patterns of mutation accumulation in the human H1N1 influenza virus since 1918. The short version here is that CNS, that's Carter and Sanford, John Sanford, genetic entropy, John Sanford, argue that the H1N1 influenza lineage descended from the 1918 pandemic went extinct in 2009 due to the accumulation of mutations and genetic entropy. There were some problems here. First, they didn't measure fitness at all in this paper, didn't even try to measure fitness. They used two proxies for fitness, virulence and uh, codon bias um, correlation with the host. Both of those are terrible proxies for fitness. I did a video covering this link below. You can get all the details there. Uh, they also used the wrong genome for comparison, which is just delightful. Uh, they used a genome from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. If you are of a certain age, you may remember that pandemic. The problem is the virus from that pandemic was highly reassorted, which is a form of recombination that segmented viral genomes can do. And of the eight segments in that 2009 pandemic virus, uh, only one of those segments was actually descended from the 1918 pandemic lineage, and it wasn't descended through humans. It was descended through a cross-species transmission, I want to say into pigs, and then it was that swine flu lineage that was descended from the 1918 pandemic that then jumped back into humans, or part of it, one genome segment of it, was in part of the reassorted virus that jumped back into humans in 2009. The other seven genome segments were reassorted from other avian and swine viruses. They weren't a direct lineage from the 1918 pandemic. So all those mutations that they said accumulated in a linear fashion since 1918, they didn't. Those mutations are mostly due to reassortment in the 2009 virus. And then they obfuscated that fact when challenged on it. This paragraph is from a piece uh, that I'm going to talk about in more detail in a little bit, but there was part of it trying to refute my critique of the uh, 2012 paper and to show that the differences they documented were due to single base uh, substitutions rather than reassortment. They showed this alignment right here. This is a genome alignment if you're not familiar with it. Uh, showing strains from 1918 through 1936. The problem is, I'm not saying that the 18 to 36 strains were reassorted. No, those were all in humans. That's fine. It was the 2009 one they used as the reference genome for comparison that was reassorted. It's the differences relative to that one. And they just totally obfuscated that fact. And I want to be very clear again, Carter knows better because he's an expert in this stuff. There's one more thing I want to point out here. The best thing about this paper is that the, the, the pre-2009 influenza strain that they say went extinct in 2009 following the pandemic, it didn't actually go extinct. It still circulates at low levels. So this paper just full of obvious things that they should have gotten right. The final really bad argument I want to talk about is this gem from the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is obviously, you know, within, I forget what when this was, but this was obviously during the pandemic. Uh, this is amazing. It's, uh, is COVID-19 evolving? No, 
but it is changing rapidly. Think about that sentence for a minute. COVID-19 is changing, but it's not evolving. Look, Dr. Carter knows the definition of evolution, right? There's the, the most basic textbook definition that every student learns. It's the change in allele frequencies in a population over generations, or if you want to be a little broader about it, the change in the heritable characteristics in populations over generations, right? Something like that phrasing is like the most basic, bare bones, undergraduate biology definition of evolution. The SARS coronavirus 2 virus is evolving, right? There's no question about that. It's silly to even ask the question. But what he's doing here is he's misrepresenting the basic definition in order to mislead his audience. Sure, it can change, but it hasn't developed anything new. Sure, it could change, but it's still just a virus. This isn't evolution. It's just change in genetic traits over generations. This is ridiculous. He clearly knows the definition of evolution. He's just misrepresenting it. It's not more complicated than that, but it gets worse. It gets so much worse because these are kind of technical critiques, right? These are bad arguments that he's using that I think it's reasonable to conclude he knows are bad. But there's also bad conduct because, dear audience, I want to convince you that in addition to making bad arguments, Dr. Rob Carter is bad, actually. I've long given him the benefit of the doubt. For a long time, I thought that he was basically being honest and making good faith arguments in the evolution and creation discourse, right? Along the lines of people like Todd Wood and Kurt Wise. Now, I've read a lot of Todd Wood and less Kurt Wise because he's not in my field, but I've read his work as well. My impression of both of them is that they are trying to be honest. They are not being personal about it. They're basically acting in good faith uh, with regards to the arguments they're making and in terms of how they treat the arguments of people who disagree with them, right? And I thought Dr. Carter, for a long time, I thought, was basically doing the same thing. But then he responded to the video I did uh, with Erica and Dapper Dinosaur on that 10-minute clip I told you about a few minutes ago from Volume 2 of his Genesis History. And we called that video, Dr. Rob Carter Gets Everything Wrong. Um, and man, did he respond to it. It was something else. It was basically a temper tantrum, right, on, you know, a CMI article. But it was it was basically a temper tantrum. Uh, Robert Carter gets everything wrong, responding to even more ridiculous aspersions. Um, he called our video a mock fest. He accused me of lying about things like reading uh, a book that would be Genetic Entropy by John Sanford, uh, and also about reading creationist responses to my own work. He says I respond to them without reading them. Uh, okay. He tried to dox Dapper Dinosaur unsuccessfully. Turns out there are two Dapper Dinosaurs on YouTube, and Dr. Rob Carter, before he edited the article to remove the doxing, actually doxed the wrong one. Now, luckily, I think that guy is kind of out there publicly, so, like, it wasn't actually a problem. But at the time, uh, and still really, Dapper Dinosaur is still, you know, kind of undercover. He's since done a face reveal, but, like, nobody knows who he is. Um, he would try to dox somebody. That's not okay. You can't just try to dox somebody when they're anonymous on the internet, on their YouTube channel. If they want to be known, they can be known. People know who I am. I'm out here with my face, with my name. You know who I am. If someone is doing a channel and they have, you know, a character, a persona, an avatar, and they're keeping their identity private, you can't just go out and dox them because they criticized you. That's like possibly the worst behavior I'm going to talk about in this whole thing. There's a lot of other stuff I'm going to talk about, but that was really bad. And it's really fortunate that he didn't do it accidentally. It wasn't for lack of trying. Um, but I'm legitimately still mad about that. And Dapper Dinosaur should be too. It was ridiculous. Uh, he randomly, in the same piece, insulted Dr. Josh Swamidas, who you may know him. He does the Peaceful Science Forum. He's really cool. Um, he was not involved in any way with the video that we did. He just, like, there's just, like, a random paragraph in there just, like, insulting him for no reason. I have no idea why. Um, he spent paragraphs whining about our tone, complaining that we're not experts, uh, c accusing us of hypocrisy. It's just a lot of just, like, personal complaints rather than substantive responses to the critique. 
he didn't do much to address the arguments that we made. And in fact, um, Erica and I actually did a response to his response. Um, and it took us half an hour to get to the actual content because as you work through the articles from the top, it's just like a whole bunch of complaining first before you get to any substance. So all of this, this whole saga will be linked down below. You can check it out at your leisure if you want. It's really something else to read an article like this from, you know, a professional. And then in the comments, there was this gem. Uh, this this uh, user commented saying the channel standing for truth makes many videos refuting Gibbon, Scuts of Gibbon, Aaron Ra, probably Dan. Their videos are very good. Greetings. Um, so this is in the comments on that Carter gets everything wrong response that I just told you about. And you can see here that Rob Carter responded to that comment recommending the Standing for Truth channel, who I've talked about before. Um, but you can't read it right now if you go to that. You can't read it. Huh. I wonder what he said before the comment disappeared. This is a good lesson to everybody. If you ever see something good on the internet, take a screenshot. Because comments can be deleted. But screenshots last forever. What he said about the Standing for, about Standing for Truth channel before he deleted it was, yes, they are friends of CMI. I have been on their show, as has my office mate, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Even better, they did a great job at answering Stern Cardinal's criticisms of my waiting time video. So Rob Carter, down with Standing for Truth. Now, if you don't know who Standing for Truth is, uh, if you're watching this, you may very well know. If you don't, uh, it's Standing for Truth. It's Donnie is the main guy that's standing. It's his kind of internet name is Standing for Truth. Uh, he's got a bunch of associates. Uh, Raw Matt is another one. And uh, they have this, this kind of channel, group of channels. Uh, they're associated with uh, Kent Hovind, which a uh, truly despicable character. You can find videos I've done on him and plenty of videos other people have done on him, specifically Atheist Jr. and Paul Gia have done a couple great um, collaborations. So you should check those out. Link below. Carter is apparently cool with them. Now, if you want my opinion on them, uh, you can check an earlier video in the series, Creationist Behaving Badly, Standing for Truth, uh, from the summer of 2022. I think I released that video. Uh, link down below. You can check that out. But Rob Carter's cool with them. Maybe he doesn't know, like, some of the unseemly behavior that we get from the Standing for Truth channel. In fact, he is aware of their behavior. Because I pointed it out to him. A while back, when I was young and naive, I saw that Dr. Carter was scheduled to appear on the Standing for Truth channel. So I emailed him as a professional courtesy. I'm going to read to you uh, the email that I sent him in its entirety. Uh, here it is on screen, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it to you so that you can see, audience, you can see exactly how this interaction goes. I said, I hope to reach Dr. Carter. I should say I'm um, emailing the general CMI email because I, I couldn't find Carter's email. So I said, I hope to reach Dr. Rob Carter. I'm not sure the best way to do that, so I hope I can reach him. Dr. Carter, I'm sending this message as a professional courtesy. We disagree on some fundamental issues, but I appreciate the detail, care, and clarity in your work. I saw that you were planning to appear on the Standing for Truth SFT YouTube channel on Monday. I think you ought to be aware that SFT not infrequently engages in vulgar attacks on opponents. For example, I showed him a screenshot of a particularly vulgar attack on somebody and permits and encourages misogyny. For example, see the heart icon here. Another example where SFT hearted a misogynistic comment. It's clear to me that you strive to be extremely professional when you engage with critic critiques and critics, as you were when I reached out a few years ago with questions about your 2012 paper on H1N1 with Dr. Sanford. So I feel you ought to be aware of the conduct of the people and platforms you appear with and on. Warm regards, Dr. Daniel Stern Cardinal. Basically, the idea here is I'm saying, look, this group, Standing for Truth Intellectual Consortium, if you will, um, they do these run-of-the-mill interview kind of things, but they're also just like kind of immature jerks, and they're kind of vulgar, and they're kind of misogynistic, and like, as one professional to another, like, I've seen you, you try to keep it above board, everything seems good with you, you've been nice to me and professional with me in the past, I don't want your appearance on there, your association with them to cause any problems like with your employer or something. So just like be aware of, you know, their deal 
before you go on their channel, right? And I thought that was a nice thing to do, right? Just professional courtesy. Be aware of what you're doing. His response. Daniel, thank you for your concerns. We wish everyone were perfect. Robert. So, okay, he's aware. And as we saw in that comment, you know, they're friends of CMI and it's fine, I guess. You can tell a lot about people by who their friends are. There is more. We are not quite done yet. There was also a long piece that Price, Carter, and Sanford co-authored uh, basically about genetic entropy and responding to critics. It was called Responding to Supposed Refutations of Genetic Entropy from the Experts. Um, I love this. Supposed refutations, experts. I mean, like, not to toot my own horn, but like part of my dissertation was about... Um, mutation accumulation in viral populations and the fitness effects of that mutation accumulation. Like, that's literally what I, like, wrote my thesis on, uh, at least part of it. Um, so, like, yeah, I am an expert, like, in evolution and genetics, but also, like, in this specific thing, genetic entropy, right? Like, mutation accumulation and fitness. I'm an expert in that. One of the other people they're criticizing here is Dr. Joe Felsenstein, who literally wrote the textbook that you use in graduate school, like population genetics textbook. So like, yeah, he's an expert on this, right? Anyway, this piece, again, link down below along with my video response to it. I did a response to this when it came out. Um, it's full of just like straw man arguments and thinly veiled insults. And in particular, Sanford's bits are like their little kind of standalone things where he just like insults the people that criticize him and dismisses their critiques. Now, I don't know how much of that piece Price wrote versus Carter. Sanford's bits are on their own. The rest of it, I don't know how much was Price and how much was Carter. But like, if you're on as a co-author, you're in for the whole thing. You can't just be like, oh, I didn't write that paragraph. If you're a co-author, you signed off on it, you're responsible for it. So that brings us at long last to the precipitating incident for this whole video, right? What finally did it? What was the straw that broke the camel's back that made me think, you know, this Carter guy, I don't think he's on the level. Here's what's going on. Uh, a little while back, uh, Guts at Gibbon, Erica, put out this video, this two-hour, extremely con comprehensive video on the human-chimp uh, genetic similarity comparison done by Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins. That's him pictured in the thumbnail there. And uh, she reproduced his methodology in extreme detail, was extremely comprehensive about this, and basically showed that by his methodology, you get this much lower, this artificially low level of similarity between humans and chimps, like in the 80 to 85% range. Um, but when you do that same methodology for other things, like, uh, I forget the specific pairs of organisms she used, but stuff that creationists would say are all, you know, related, like you know, dogs and wolves or something, right? Stuff like that. Um, you get similarly low levels. And in fact, when you compare two different human genome sequences, you get low levels of similarity, like in the 80s. So it's a completely invalid methodology for making this comparison between humans and chimps and therefore saying, aha, they must be, you know, separately created kinds. Rob Carter responded to this video right? He responded to Erica's video. Now, Tompkins has not responded to any of the critiques of his work, but a bunch of other people have come to his defense, Carter among them. And he built this video, you can see right there, an honest appraisal of our differences. But here's the thing with this honest appraisal. It sure looks like he either didn't watch Erica's video, or he's lying about the, the substance of Erica's video. And I'm showing some comments here from YouTube, from Carter's video here. So you can see, uh, this is biblical genetics, that's Carter. He says, I am unaware of any creationists who have duplicated his Tompkins methods on horses, donkeys, lions, tigers, etc. I am also unaware of evolutionists who have duplicated his methods at all. And then you've got Guts of Gibbon right here. Hi, Dr. Carter, that's precisely what I did. I thought you would watch the video. Carter responds later on, I am not convinced you reproduced his methods. Here's the thing. Erica's video is two hours long. It's super comprehensive and goes through this bit by bit by bit, the history of Tompkins' work and her reproductions of that work. And in her video, if you watch it, she'll walk through side by side exactly what she does at each step to accurately reproduce his work. 
So there's no validity to saying, I'm not convinced you reproduced his methods. What's your sort, like what, I'm supposed to trust you on that one? Like, explain why. In this video that Carter did, which is about 20 minutes long, at one point he just says, I'm not going to go into details about Erica's techniques. Are you kidding me? That's the whole point. That's the thing you're disputing, is that she actually replicated Tompkins' techniques, right? But you're just not going to go into it. You're just going to say, it doesn't, no, that's wrong, trust me. That's not okay. And this was recent, I should say. This was just, as I record this, within the last couple of weeks, this all went down. This pushed it over the edge for me. This is clearly not a good faith effort to, you know, talk about this issue. This is not an honest appraisal here, right? This is nonsense. This is not how you do this. So this is what pushed me over the edge to finally, at long last, coming around to the position that Rob Carter is not a good faith actor. So let's wrap this up. Is this as flashy as the bad behavior I've documented before? No. It's not like the, the stuff I documented with Standing for Truth. It's not like the uh, transphobia and conspiracies coming out of AIG with Ken Ham. It's not like that stuff. What I've documented here is actually pretty typical for young Earth creationists. But Carter had been, to me better than all of that for a long time, maybe for too long after I should have changed my opinion of him. Uh, I'm not mad. I, I'm really just disappointed because I really did for a long time genuinely think that Carter was basically in the same mold as like Kurt Wise and Todd Wood, right? Basically good faith, young earth creationists being honest about their work and its limitations and evolution, right? And just trying to make the case as best he could. Um, I don't think that's the case anymore. He's clearly not making good faith arguments, doesn't appear interested in doing it. I should have figured that out sooner, right? I should have figured out that that was the case sooner, but here we are. Everyone reaches their conclusions in their own time. I do want to say that this does not mean I don't think anybody should engage with Rob Carter. I think it's very important to engage with Rob Carter and Dr. Carter, if you watch this, I would love to have you on for a chat. I still, my invitation to you is very much still on the table. I would love to talk to you because I think we would have uh, a really good, uh, productive, interesting conversation for our respective audiences. Um, so I still do want to talk to you, but um, I think the conduct over the years that I've been uh, participating in it and witnessing it uh, is very clear at this point that... Um, this is not entirely above board, right? And I want to make that clear to my audience. So thank you for watching this installment of Creationists Behaving Badly on Dr. Rob Carter of Creation Ministries International. Please take a moment to hit the like button, leave a comment, share this video, subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and remember, don't get fooled.